Let's, uh, let's begin with our opening psalm, as you'll find it in your bulletin, Psalm 133, and we will read that psalm responsibly. It's a very short psalm. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. We'll begin by singing our opening hymn, hymn 649. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the 
this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise let us pray to the lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> our first reading this day, which is also the basis for our message, comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 2, and begin reading with verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And here then also reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, begin reading with verse 19. This is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. And at this time I'd like to especially address uh, the children that are online uh, with us here today. And I want you to begin by thinking of, of something nice Maybe another child or an adult did for you. Just something nice that was done for you. Maybe it's something they helped you with, something they gave you, some way that they blessed you. You know, I remember when I was in elementary school and I was growing up, and I would be helped with a lot of different things, but um, I kind of struggled with my handwriting a little bit. Kind of had sloppy handwriting still do but um, my teachers tried to help me and they gave me some uh, some uh, books and things to help you know like this one here and uh, here I could practice uh, writing in cursive and then they would see how I did and I could write on the line rock below it and see how mine compared to it or when my kids were younger and they were going to school they, they actually used this book Again, learning how to write, and then part of it, they got to write uh, Bible verses out. They got to go to a Christian school, and we're blessed in that way. But people help us in a lot of different ways. And in our Bible verse today, it kind of talks about that. You know, Jesus had died on the cross for our sin. He had risen from the dead, so that when we believe in him, we'll go to heaven. He had ascended into the heavens. He, he promised to send his Holy Spirit, and he did. And, and 3,000 people were added to the church. And then this brings us to Acts chapter 2, to our text today. And there we see the church was together. And 
And when they met together, they did good things for one another. It's called fellowship. Not only did they spend time together and worship together, but they cared for one another and helped one another in, in very real ways. And that was good. It's good when we are in church as well. You know, we come to church and we're blessed. We're blessed spiritually as we hear the word. And, and when we're older, we receive the sacrament and all these sorts of things. But part of the blessing of being in church isn't just for me or for you personally, but it's for others as well. It's good when we're together as a church. God has brought us to be here for one another to encourage one another, to help one another, and we call this fellowship. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in our, our message today. But this week I want you to remember that Jesus has done some wonderful things for you. He has saved you. He has delivered you. He's made you to be a part of his church. Now look for ways that you can be a blessing to others as well. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. And the Holy Gospel this day comes to us from John chapter 10, beginning reading with the first verse. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the Gospel of the Lord. And at this time we will join together in confessing our common Christian faith as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we'll sing our next hymn, hymn 644, and we'll do verses 1 through 3. Verses 1 through 3. Thank you.
Lord. What does a church look like? What should the church look like? In our text today from Acts chapter 2, we receive uh, the first glimpse in the book of Acts of what the early church looked like. Oh, there will be other pictures given to us throughout the book of Acts and in the epistles, the letters to the churches. But today we get a first glimpse at things. And today I'd like to especially focus on one key aspect of what the church was like, and that is that aspect of fellowship. So what does fellowship look like in the church? What should fellowship look like in the church? In the early church, it began as God the Holy Spirit came upon his people, and he worked in their lives through the Word, through baptism, through communion, and, and brought them to faith. In fact, in verse 42 of our text, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. That word that they had received from the Lord Jesus and was then handed on by the apostles to others. And they gathered around that word and they trusted in it and relied upon it. They found unity in their belief, in their doctrine, in their confession of faith, just as we just confessed our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, along with Christians all throughout this globe. Fellowship involved unity, oneness of faith. And this oneness was also found in, in the breaking of bread. Now that could refer to a couple of things. First of all, it could refer to these agape meals that the early church had, usually before they would receive communion. They would gather together, they would share a meal together. It was kind of their version of a, of a potluck, which we'll have next Sunday, by the way. But the breaking of bread also could involve Holy Communion. As they would gather together and receive the body and the blood of Christ shed for them for the forgiveness of sins. Because fellowship truly can't be happen unless there is forgiveness. And there they would gather on the forgiveness that the Lord gave and would be able to thereby forgive one another as well. So they fellowshiped around the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, and they were blessed greatly because of it. Fellowship also included unity in their prayer life. They prayed about the things God wanted them to pray about. They thanked God and praised God for the deliverance that they had in, had in Jesus Christ and for the word that he had made known to them for the joy of the resurrection. They prayed about the mission of the early church. And they prayed for the needs of one another. A great example of that can be found in a couple chapters later, in Acts chapter 4. Furthermore, fellowship for the early church involved not only in those things that we usually think of as spiritual, Word of God, communion, prayer life. But it also involved being there for one another in very real ways to help one another with physical needs. Consider verses 44 and 45 of our text. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They had their possessions in common. They regarded the things that they owned not just as belonging to them individually, but to be there to be shared, to be a blessing for others as well. Now this was not some form of 
forced communism as we may know it today. This was not some strange cult with stringent demands. This was not forced. This was done freely. This was done on a volunteer basis. God blessed them and they freely gave. Their faith and unity in Christ Jesus enabled these people with different nationalities, backgrounds, different education, so many ethnicities to care for one another as family, to be there for one another and to love one another so richly. It was the love of Christ, the unity that they shared in the faith, the blessings that God had given to them that brought them together to freely share in this way. If someone was in financial need, they saw to it that those needs would be met the best they could. You can read further about that again in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 6 will pick it up as well. But the early church, they lived for the Lord and they lived for one another. This is the picture the book of Acts gives to us of the early church. What about us today? What does fellowship look like today as we gather around the cross of Christ? Oftentimes when people think of fellowship, they think of uh, coffee and donut time. And it can include that. The early church did meet together for meals. They did gather at the table. But it's not limited to that. Others may think of fellowship as, as something that just happens here in this place. And certainly it should happen in, in church. But it's not limited to a building or to a place. Some people may even try to avoid Christian fellowship. Some like to be a part of larger congregations for that very reason. They can kind of slip in and out without really being noticed. They don't have to engage with people on a personal level. They don't have to socialize. They don't have to be there for the body of believers. Oh, it is sad when it's broken people living in this world and this individualistic culture. We simply focus upon only in ourselves and we neglect the fellowship that we have with other Christians. Some may come like consumers looking for what they want. And then when receiving it, that's it. This is not the picture God gives to us of the early church. The picture he gives to us is that of a body of believers gathered around Christ in unity of faith and in fellowship with other believers. In Romans chapter 12, verse 5, there's an interesting verse. It says, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Individually members of one another. We belong to one another. We have a connection to one another. We have a responsibility toward one another. We are part of the united, the body of Christ. We are part of a congregation we are part of a synod, part of a denomination, and part of the Holy Christian Church in this world. And so what does fellowship look like for us today? Well, devoted to God and to each other. Gathered around the word of Christ, the apostles' teaching, gathered around the cross of Christ, we trust and we treasure what he has done for us. We believe in our Lord Jesus, and this brings to us unity. We know that he died on the cross for our sins, for our shallow fellowship or cheap indifference. 
We've been united in our faith, not only that our sins are forgiven, but that Christ has risen and that he will raise us up to spend eternity together in heavenly glory. We have a unity in faith. A unity in faith established by the sound biblical teachings and the word of God handed down to us going all the way back to the apostles and Christ himself. We are blessed in so many rich ways. We have a unity as well when we gather here at the communion realm and we receive the body and blood, the breaking of the bread. And we gather together as one body in Christ. Furthermore, Christian fellowship today is something we do not just by logging on, but we do as we gather with other Christians. Let me share a few thoughts with you. First of all, I believe that one of the key things about fellowship is, is simply meeting together. And it might sound kind of obvious, but again, consider verse 46 of our text. We're told how the early church met together daily in the temple as they attended worship together. And they gathered regularly in their homes through the breaking of bread. It's hard to have fellowship if we don't meet together. Fellowship can't happen just by logging on and, and watching a service online and doing nothing more. Now granted, sometimes that is the best we can do. And if that's the case, well then that's the best we can do. We spend time together. We share that bond that Christ has called us. We gather around his word and his sacrament. And we are there with and for one another. Fellowship as it grows deeper expresses itself in many ways as well. I think fellowship today can involve having a safe place. A safe place to be honest be vulnerable, to let our joys and our sorrows be there, to be the real us. As we share our joys and our sorrows, our triumphs and our failures, our fears and our encouragements, whatever it is that life brings our ways, all the ups and downs. Christian fellowship means that we share those joys and successes, share those fears and trials with one another and we are there to encourage one another and accept one another in Christian love. Christian fellowship today I think involves meaning that we invest time in people in real and significant ways. It can happen in a number of different ways. First of all it can happen uh, with physical needs, just as we talked about, as we saw in the early church. Sometimes it might mean helping someone out financially. Other times it might mean helping them out with a physical task. I tell you, I've seen many wonderful ways that that's taken place within our congregation here. One member may help another with shoveling snow or raking leaves picking up groceries or giving a ride to a doctor or maybe just taking the time to visit. Wonderful ways. Investing in people in real and genuine ways. It's also a willingness to invest emotionally. Let's face it, dealing with people can be a challenge. And if we truly empathize and love one another and care for one another, Dealing with someone's trials and sorrows, that's tough. Because it starts to affect us. And dealing with someone's joys and successes can also have an effect on us. But we're willing to engage and to be there and care for one another, even in regard to the emotions. When it is easy and when it is difficult. 
Christian fellowship also involves quite a, obviously I would think, and that is investing in one another spiritually. We're willing to pray with and for one another. We're willing to listen to one another and successes and doubts and struggles that they have along the journey in their Christian walk. We're willing to share a Christian word of encouragement, maybe scripture, or just some positive words of encouragement and faith. We're willing to encourage others to worship regularly, to be in Holy Scripture and to study and, and look at it daily in their devotions, to spend time in prayer and to engage in the body of Christ. So many different ways that fellowship can play out. Now I've shared a few ideas that I've had on my mind that I see in Holy Scripture here. But certainly I haven't shared everything that could possibly be shared about Christian fellowship. So here's your opportunity. What if I miss? What other aspects of Christian fellowship come to your mind of, of what the church should look like? I'm going to give you a chance to go ahead and just share it with the group here. Remember, there's no judgmentalism here. Right? We accept one another and welcome one another. But any ideas that you have about Christian fellowship in our world today and in our church today? We want to be brave and share something. It's your opportunity. Prayer for one another. Yeah, and praying for individuals by name and specific needs. And knowing those needs and listening to those needs and all those things. Absolutely. Thank you. And activities with each other. Activities. Yeah. You know, spending time together, having fun together, right? Parades. Yeah. <laughs> Parades. There you go. <laughs> it's coming up. service activities, all kinds of different activities, right? It really helps build those bonds and those relationships as when you rub elbows together a little bit, right? Thank you. You know, and as you think of it, there may be many other ideas and insights that you have. I certainly encourage you to share those with one another and look for ways that we can carry those things up. As we consider Christian fellowship today, we realize again it is something that God establishes. God the Holy Spirit working through the Apostles' teaching, working through the sacraments, working as he gathers us around Christ in the unity that we have there. As he gives to us his spirit and moves us together to have this kind of fellowship with one another, this kind of love and care for one another. What a blessing, what a gift it is through God that we are part of the body of Christ. Indeed, give thanks to God for the fellowship that you have together because God has gathered you here in this place as a part of his body and part of his church for his purpose. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. At this time then, we gather as a body of believers as we present ourselves and our offerings to the Lord. Please rise. We pray together the created me as printed in your bulletin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, for the gift of the Christian Church. We give thanks to you for the fellowship of the body of believers. For Lord God, by your grace, you have granted to us faith. You've united, united us around the teachings and the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. You've blessed us with the means of grace with one another as well. We ask, O oh Lord, that you continually strengthen the bond of fellowship that we have. This we ask as you send your spirit for that very purpose. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord God, this day we also pray for all those who suffer in a variety of ways. We pray, O oh Lord, especially for your servants. Pat Rennie, Michael Berger, Allison Brigadier, Mary Jane Gemmel, Pastor Schoenfeld, Bob Lane, Corey and Gretchen Arns, Verlin Lindemann, James Ajay, Matilda Moha, and all that we name in our hearts. Lord, you know what the trials are for each person. And we ask again for your hand of strength, for your healing hand, and enable us as the body of believers to be there for one another through all of these trials. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray for our nation and for our state as we so often do. We ask that you especially be with the leaders who are in positions of authority, and also that you be with all citizens, that together we may work for the common good, that you would establish peace and well-being, prosperity and all good gifts according to your good and gracious will. These things and all others that are upon our hearts and our minds, we bring before you as we pray the prayer you've given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with faith and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our closing hymn, again, hymn 644, and we'll do verses 4 and 5.
often say, it's good to be together here as the body of Christ. A couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, first of all, as I think mentioned last week, certainly it's in the, been in the bulletin, trying to get a new uh, little pictorial directory uh, put together. And so if you've not already given us your picture, uh, it'd be wonderful if you would. As printed in the bulletin, there's a couple ways you can do it. Either you can go on our church track uh, website and you can uh, post it there yourself if you have one. If that's uh, not your thing and you would like somebody to help you with that, um, you can find David Diebner and he will gladly take your picture. Or um, you can email him a picture that you'd like to have up and he will get it posted uh, for you. Also, please note, as mentioned again in the bulletin, uh, next Sunday we'll have a potluck dinner. Um, we'll have pheasant and chicken. So that sounds uh, delicious. I might have to have both. And, um, otherwise, just bring out a, a dish to share. Any other announcements? Yes. Um, next week, Saturday, a week from today, Red Rock Denver is having a craft garage and bake sale. And we have a couple of ladies that are excellent bakers. So we're trying to raise money so that we can have a nice Thanksgiving and Christmas holiday. All right, and that's next Saturday then? Correct. All From right. 7 to 2, I believe it is. All right. Thank you. Any other announcements? Not seeing any then. Again, I encourage you to greet one another. 